uh, hello and uh, good evening to uh, everyone who has participated uh, uh, on the zoom and also uh, this session is live on youtube channel dr varun uh, aranagiri in the uh, the channel name will be the lecture series on mrc uh, lecture series for mrcs and mrcs aspirants and uh, my name is uh, dr varun i'm one of the specialty that working in nhs wales and this session will be for the uh, uh, exclusively for the doctors those who are uh, appearing for the mrcs exam and this is exclusively on upper limb anatomy and uh, people those who are uh, on youtube can uh, post the comments on the YouTube and those who are in Zoom can access online and they can chat Excuse me. and they can give the uh, comments on the at the end of the session and also they can ask the questions at the end of the session this is this session will be exclusively upper limb anatomy and uh, the uh, it is going to be dealt uh, for the people those who are appearing for MRCS and probably mostly clinically oriented surgical anatomy and it will be helpful for the people those who are appearing uh, for MRCS part A and also part B if in at some times and coming on to the first uh, okay uh, this is uh, a short uh, uh, note on the upper limb bones and there are 32 upper limb bones in altogether uh, including the clavicle and the scapula and the humerus which forms the shoulder girdle which attaches the upper limb to the central axis uh, the um, central axis and uh, arm uh, yeah, humerus from the uh, single bone of the arm and the ulna and radius from the uh, main bone in the arm, and there are plenty of uh, uh, bones, copper bones, and the metacarpal bones, which uh, which form which are formed, which forms the hand. And the thing which I wanted to say, in, uh, stress here is the force of the weight, or uh, the force of the weight which is transmitted to the uh, axial skeleton is through this way, and uh, this is actually the forces the force of the the force or the weight which we carry in the hand is transmitted uh, from hand to wrist and to the radius bone and from the radius is transmitted to the uh, intrashus membrane to the ulna now and from the ulna now it is get it gets transmitted to l l uh, joint and to the humerus and then to the shoulder joints pula coracoclavicular ligament clavicle sternoclavicular joint sternum and axial skeleton so this is how the force is transmitted to the axial skeleton and the most important two ligaments which are participating in this transfer of force from the hand to the axial skeleton is coracoclavicular ligament and the stenoclavicular ligament so this is how the force is transmitted to the uh, axial skeleton okay so as i said you uh, the short girdle or pectoral girdle is formed by the clavicle scapula and the humerus is uh, humerus with the scapula forms the shoulder joint and the two ligaments which i said you already is like the coracoclavicular ligament and the costoclavicular ligament which for, which transmits the whole of the ax, whole of the force in the uh, from the upper limb to the axial skeleton so before going into the anatomy in proper like i would like to say uh, we will go to the session slowly by knowing the anatomy of the bones and then the muscles which are attached to the bones and thereby attached to the bones and thereby finish of the upper anatomy and the first bone which i'm going to do is the scapula the scapula is the hand bone which is on either side of the shoulder and is placed so this is the uh, dorsal or the uh, posterior aspect of the scapula and this anterior or ventral aspect of the scapula 
So you just raise your hand as if you bless someone that shows the scapula and this anti surface and the posterior surface or the ventral aspect or the dorsal aspect is same and the scapula has got three border and two surfaces one pre border this is the medial border and this is the lateral border and the surfaces are two surfaces one is the costal uh, one is the costal surface or which is facing towards the ribs and this is the posterior surface or the dorsal surface or uh, dorsal surface which is posterior is facing towards the back so the most important thing which separates the most important thing which the uh, scapula dorsal surface of the scapula is the spinous process the spinous process continues as a chromian process and there's another another thing called as coracoid process which projects above the glenoid process the glenoid process connects the uh, it gets attached is the is the surface where the humerus gets attached to the scapula so borders wise it's medial border lateral and superior border and the processes are the process, chromian process and coracoid process and the two surfaces of ventral surface and the dorsal surface the dorsal surface is separated uh, by the spinous process into this in supraspinous process and the infraspinous process and the there's something called as superior suprascapular notch and the superior border which transmits the suprascapular suprascapular now and coming on to the muscle attachment and we slowly go progress what are the things what, what are, how to um, approach the exam for example in general the muscle how to know how to know about the actions of the muscle even if if even if we don't know the um, uh, exact action we can try to pick up the actions of the muscle by just by simple logic all the muscles acts at the insertion point so for example and let me just go to the second next slide okay so this is the dorsal surface of the scapula and the blue thing as everyone knows it's insertion uh, sides and the red shows the origin sign and uh, the supraspinous fossa uh, gives origin to the supraspinatus muscle infraspinous fossa uh, gives rise to origin of the infraspinatus muscle and these on the lateral border we have plenty of muscles from top to bottom always scapula from top to bottom think about minors and majors from top to bottom so on the lateral border teres minor in the top and the teres major in the bottom and the angle there is the origin of latissimus dorsi so we know now the origin of the supraspinous fossa uh, supraspinous muscle is supraspinous fossa and the origin of the infraspinous infraspinous muscle uh, is from the infraspinous fossa so these muscles gets attached to the humerus so when the when the, the all the muscles crosses one joint to produce to to make its action and it's helpful for the movement of the joint so these muscles crosses the humerus and crosses the shoulder joint to get the humerus or the head of the humerus so these muscles are going to act on the shoulder joint it produces action on the shoulder joint so any muscle acts at the position any muscle acts at the site of insertion it act at the site of example origin originates from the supraspinous fossa and it gets attached to the greater tubercle of the humerus it's going to act on the humerus not on the scapula so when the supraspinatus acts on the humerus and it crosses the shoulder joint the humerus is going to abduct so for example if the, I'll, I'll say you the uh, i'll show another picture on the uh, humerus how it acts and how uh, how how it moves out so these are the another thing is which i want to stress on this upper limb is the spinous process and the acromion and the clavicle 
so clavicle in the and clavicle anteriorly the spinous process posteriorly the acromion so all these three the spinous process acromion and the clavicle forms an arc from anterior to posterior or posterior to anterior and it gives insertion of the trapezius and origin to the muscle deltoid so you if you if you think about the clavicle and the acromion and the spinous process all together as an arc the trapezius gets inserted as an arc on the clavicle acromion process and the spinous process of the scapula and the deltoid gets originated from the inferior aspect of the spinous process acromion process and the clavicula clavicle so this is how it acts as an arc and if as i said you the muscle acts on the bone where it gets where it gets attached for example if the muscle gets originated from the spinous process of the spine or uh, the from the uh, uh, spinal bo spinal bones and if it acts on the scapula the trapezius is going to lift the, the shoulder lift the scapula so that means it's going to be helpful for the shrugging of the shoulder so the the trapezius lifts the scapula by lifting the spinous process and also the clavicle which is getting which where it gets inserted so uh, it's very easy to uh, get the um, easy to understand the action of a muscle by knowing its uh, the by knowing its insertion point or it's uh, not by knowing the origin so it, it's more important both both origin and insertions are important but the actions uh, can be uh, easily made by knowing the insertion point and the muscle is going to act at the insertion point so coming on to the medial border of the scapula uh, the scapula has in the, in the middle border there's an insertion of levator scapulae rhomboid is minor and major as i said you when you think think about scapula minor usually from top to bottom it is minor to major here even the lateral even the lateral border it is minor to major t is minor first and the t is major second so likewise in the medial border the rhomboid is major first minor first and the rhomboid is major second in the whole length so the coming on to this one so on the dorsal on the ventral aspect or anterior aspect we have got a huge muscle subscapularis which is the only one muscle which originates from the ventral aspect of the scapula and you know again it's going to cross the glenoid fossa and cross the cross the shoulder joint gets attached to the lesser tubercle of the humerus so it's going to act on the humerus so this is the only muscle most important muscle which is on the ventral aspect the other muscle which is going to be attached to the medial aspect of the medial aspect medial aspect and ventral aspect medial border and ventral aspect of the scapula is the serratus anterior so it is it gets attached to the whole of the scapula whole of the medial border of the scapula to uh, uh to get to so to act on it so the serratus anterior is going to act on the ventral aspect and the medial border of the scapula okay uh, slowly i think you, uh, you you guys will pick it up and uh, as as we as we progress i'll explain you here and there and uh, what are the things uh, how to get a, get the actions easily so other other two muscles other muscles which are which gets originated from scapula are uh, the coracobrachialis and the shaft uh, biceps from the coracoid process and it has got combined origin and the two long heads of the biceps and the triceps originates from the top of the glenoid tubercle and the uh, bottom of the glenoid tubercle so the bicep gets the long head of biceps originate from the top of the glenoid tuber, uh, glenoid process and the uh, long head of uh, triceps originates from the inferior aspect of the glenoid process so glenoid process uh, are the glenoid surface which which helps the um, which helps the humerus to get attached to the scapula and forms the shoulder joint it is okay so this is again um, this is again a good uh, okay so coming from the 
post tv aspect we have got, uh, we got a big muzzle which completely covers the shoulder blade or the scapula on the posterior aspect of the uh, body so that's the huge long broad muzzle which covers the posterior aspect is the trapezius so as i said you the muzzle is going to act on the bone where it gets inserted it's not going to act on the origin so it gets originated from the occiput base of the arm of the um, cervical vertebra and nuchal line the t1 t1 to t4 vertebra t5 to t12 vertebra so it has got a very broad origin on the post and it gets inserted as i said you it you make an arc uh, imaginary arc posterior by the spinal process of the scapula acromion process on the lateral Lateral, lateral aspect and anteriorly by the clavicles or superior aspect of the clavicle. So it gets inserted into the superior surface of all these processes. And the, as everyone knows that the muzzle is tied to the spinal accessory, spinal accessory now or the 11th cranial now. So the upper fibers is upper fibers of the trapezius gets attached to the anterior arc are the superior surface of the clavicle the middle fibers gets attached to the acromion process on the spinous spinous process of the scapula and the lower fibers gets attached to the gets attached to the spinous process on the medial aspect of the spinous process so when these muscles act so when the upper fibers act middle fibers act it's going to push pull pull the scapula up and on both the aspects, if it pulls up, it's going to produce the movement called a shrugging of the shoulder. So that's how we check the trapezius, we check the intactness of the accessory muscle. Okay. And as I said, you this is going to origin to the deltoid fibers again. So are the on the other aspect, it gets inserted, the trapezius gets inserted. Uh, on the interior aspect of this arc, it gives in the muzzle, deltoid muzzle. In the deltoid muzzle has got three fibers, anterior fibers, middle fibers on the lateral aspect, and the posterior fibers of the posterior fibers on posterior on the posterior aspect. So okay, let me come to the deltoid muzzle later. As I said you the trapezius has got bar broad origin and it's inserts into the, into the clavicle process and the spinous process of the scapula and it action as i said you it elevates the upper fiber elevates the clavicle the lower fibers elevates the acromion and the spinous process of the scapula so it helps in the helps in the check the shoulder the lower fibers pulls the scapula back and also elevates so depresses the uh, inferior fibers uh, so this is what is called as shrugging of the shoulder, and this is um, this can be elicited for intactness of the accessory now, uh, the cranial eleventh cranial now the move to the eleventh cranial. Okay, so the other muscle which covers the of the back, uh, which is uh, again part of the muscle, is the lattice muscle. The initial muzzle which covers the whole the upper part of the back is the trapezius, and the other muzzle which covers whole of the back is the lattice muscle. And this muzzle clinically is helped for re reconstruction, and probably the, there will be questions on the cost uh, uh, on the clinical significance of lattice muscle something called as LD flap. So the, the, the lattice muscle is used in the breast reconstruction. Uh, the LD flap is used in the primary breast reconstruction. The other flap which is used for breast reconstruction is the tram flap. Tram flap has got a name in it. T-R-A-M. T-R stands for transverse abdominis flap or these two are the primary flaps which are used for breast reconstruction on table, which is done knee 
pedicle or a major blood supply under which the uh, flap survives. So this lattice must downside survives on thoracodosal artery. So the thoracodosal artery, which is a kind of branch of branch from the, uh, um, uh, I, I think it's from the uh, axillary artery. So it uh, it is the main artery which supplies the lattice must downside and the flap survives on this, on the on the basis of that artery. I'm going to the oxygen insertion So this muscle has a different insertion. So fiber, the fibers of the lattice must say the lower fibers of the lattice must say ins gets inserted on the upper end of the uh, upper uh, upper uh, on the, it gets twisted when it gets inserted. So the actions are a bit quite is is a bit tricky. When it when you when you can when it comes to the actions of this muscle, so it cannot give you the clear straightforward action. It gives a different kind of action. So even here you can see the muscle fibers, the upper muscle fibers gets inserted in the bicipital groove in the humerus, but it gets the lower fibers gets inserted above and the upper fibers gets inserted below. So there's a twist in the insertion of the lattice muscle in the bicipital groove. So the origin of the muscle of the lattice muscle dasa is from the T4 spinous process spines of this inferior six vertebra T6 to T12 and in the lumbar vertebra L1 to L5 and it is also from the upper neurosis of the lumbar fascia. So it starts, it's, it originates as an uh, muscle fiber and it's originated as a upper neurosis in the spinous process of the T6 to T12, L1 to L5, and also from the iliac crest, it originates and it runs, the fibers runs upwards. And as I said, it gets inserted into the bicipital groove, but there is a twist in the insertion. It gets the fibers, the upper fibers gets inserted um, uh, inferiorly, the lower fiber gets inserted superiorly. So the action, so if the upper fiber gets contracted, it acts on the humerus and it extends the arm and it adducts the arm and there's a medial rotation. So that's why there's a, so when it acts, it extends. So you can see the extension of the arm by action, by the action of the lattice must say, and the actions are extended, extends abduction and medial rotation of, of the arm at the shoulder joint. And the most important thing is the nerve supply is the thoracodosal nerve. And as I said, you this muscle is the muscle which is helpful for the breast reconstruction or the lattice must, uh, breast primary breast reconstruction when we do a mastectomy or removal of breast tissue in total. So this is another muscle which is a broad the muscle that means they gets originated in with different fibers, and it gets attached with uh, insert to a uh, to a particular point. So this is another muscle called a serratus anterior muscle, which originates anteriorly. It goes anterior to the scapula, uh, anterior to the scapula, and attaches attaches medially the medial border of the ventral aspect. So you can see this muscle gets attached to the scapula on the medial border of the uh, scapula and it has got eight pinners. Pinners are nothing but the eight different fibers originating from the different ribs. So it has got eight pinners which originates from the ribs and gets attached to the scapula on the costal surface or the anterior surface, whatever its costal surface or anterior surface and the muscle when it acts, as I said to you, the muscle acts at the insertion point. When it starts pulling up, so the muscle, the scapula moves forwards. So that's the most important thing. The, it, it, it helps in the, it helps in the um, uh, movement of the scapula forward. So when this, this muscle is supplied by the, now called as long thoracic nerve of bell, uh, the nerve to long thoracic nerve, of bell. This again is a clinical insignificance. This now is, there's a chance of injury of this now when we do an axillary dissection. And when the surgeon goes very close to the thoracic wall and dissects the um, 
this is the fat from the thoracic wall there is a chance of injury to the long thoracic nerve of bell and when this injury happens the muscle loses its the muscle loses its action and there is a chance of winging of scapula so this is the this is called as winging of scapula and what happens when the winging of scapula happens is it protracts and rotates the scapula and the nerve which is damaged is long thoracic nerve of bell and the most clinical most important clinical significance is when we do the axillary dissection very close to the thoracic wall we may be injuring the long thoracic nerve of bell which can lead on to the winging of scapula and i'll let you know all the branches uh, in brachial plexus in future slides next and these are other few muscles which are attached to the scapula so as i said you the muscle acts on the insertion side the three muscles which gets inserted to the scapula on the medial border, on the medial border when we see it when we see from the posterior aspect so what has happened is we have trapezium off so we have taken off the trapezium which was which got which which gets originated from the uh, superior nuchal line or the occipital prominence and the um, t12 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 vertebras up to t1 to t12 vertebra. we removed the trapezius from here and as we remove the trapezius we could see all these key muscles which gets inserted in the scapula and this muscle this levator name of the muscle itself says the levator levator means it's going to elevate the scapula this muscle elevates the scapula and the rhomboid is minor and major as i said you when when it comes to scapula minor comes at the top and the uh, uh, major comes at the bottom so the rhomboid is minor and the major so it gets all from the rhomboid is minor gets originated from the c7 spine to l l uh, t1 spine and uh, the rhomboid major originates from t2 to t5 uh, vertebra spine sinus process of the uh, vertebra and it gets attached to the dorsal surface on the medial border of the scapula and again action it's very easy to remember this is levator scapula the name itself says it elevates the scapula and the rhomboid is minor and major so when this muscle act pull the scapula backwards so it causes the retraction of the scapula so the scapula gets pulled back or the retraction so retraction of the scapula is by the rhomboid is minor and the major and the all so when it comes to how to remember the nerves nerve supply of muscle think about the muscles in group and you will get the answer for the uh, nerve supply most of the time the the nerves the, the nerves are supplied in groups so the dorsal scapula nerve which is again a branch from the brachial plexus supplies all the muscles from the medial on the, on the medial border which gets inserted into the scapula and the only muscle which is uh, which, uh, uh, all these three muscles are supplied by the scapula now so the other muscle or when we, when it comes to the lateral border of the lateral border of the uh, scapula as i said you T is minor first and the T is major second again the latissimus dorsi uh, and the in from the angle of the scapula is the origin all these originates and uh, these muscles gets inserted into the humerus straight away so just make a straight line like this so it gets inserted into the humerus and it acts on the humerus again it acts on the humerus so coming on to the deltoid muscle so as i said you already make an arc which is formed so this is a clear picture which shows the arc as i said you so this is the arc which is bony arc which is formed by the spinous process of the scapula acromion process of the scapula and the clavicle anteriorly so this is what the arc which i said this arc is the most important arc so the trapezius from the and it gets the origin of the muscles deltoid happens from the inferior aspect of this arc so the uh, deltoid has got three parts again three fibers anterior fibers which gets originated from the clavicle the lateral aspect of the clavicle and uh, 
the acromion process uh, and the acromion process gives rise to the middle fibers and the posterior fibers from the spinous process. So all these muscle fibers gets attached to the uh, delta on the lateral aspect of the humerus. So automatically the delta action is going to be on the humerus. Okay, it's not going to be the uh, it's it's insertion point where it's where, where the muscle is act. So when the fiber is going to contract, it's going to abduct the arm. So deltoid is going to abduct the arm. But what about the initial abduction? The initial abduction is not by the deltoid. The initial abduction of the arm is by the supraspinatus muscle. So that's going to be another important. Uh, um, uh, uh, MCQ for the MRCS granules. The initial abduction is by the supraspinatus, and from 15 to 90 degrees, the deltoid helps in the abduction. So, this is about the origin and insertion of the deltoid. So, the nerve supply is by the axillary now, and anything on the regiment band. So, yeah, regiment band side, just on the tip of the on two shoulders. Like if you if you touch the shoulder. So that's the area where we keep we have the regiment band. So the regiment band side is for the axillary now. So any injury to the axillary now can damage the nerve supply to the deltoid and also to the teres minor. If I'm not wrong, yeah, stain is minor. So these are these are the uh, origin and insertion of the deltoid and the action of the deltoid is the abduction of the arm but not the initial abduction and the nerve supply is this thing and let's go to the next okay so when we reflect the delta reflect the delta and we see all these muscles when reflect the delta as i said this is r which i said you spinous process anteriorly clavicle laterally acromion the spinous process uh posteriorly so when this muscle these arc gives rise to the and when this arc the muscle is reflected we see all this rotator muscle underneath the delta. so it's very easy to remember always top end of the humerus top head or the atomic neck and the tubercle the tubercle and the and the surgical so this is called a surgical neck of the Humerus, it's below or inferior to the inferior to the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. This is the anatomical neck. It's between the head of the humerus and the tubercle. There's, there's a group called as anatomical neck, and this is the surgical neck, just below the or inferior to the greater tubercle. The the clinical of the humerus is. When there is a fracture of the humerus, the surgical injury to the axillary nerve. So this axillary nerve, the sensation of the axillary nerve, the, the, the sensory supply of the axillary nerve is the regiment band or the um, skin over the surface of the deltoid. So we can, if there is an injury to the axillary nerve with the shoulder, shoulder, head of the humerus fracture, there is a loss of sensation on the regiment band side. It's actually there's an injury to the axillary now. So coming on to the rotator cuff muscle. So think about the, the muscle which which I said about supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and the subscapularis. So from superior to posterior aspect, and this is anterior. So keep your fingers like this, as shown in the picture. So the thumb is thumb is anterior and the um, ring finger is posterior. The anterior are the thumb, which which represents subscapularis. It's very easy to remember. Sit, S I T. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. So here the supraspinatus are the, the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus is sub, supplied by dorsal scapula now. Uh, uh, sorry, so, uh, supraspinatus now and the Subscapular is by the uh, subscapular now, and the teres minor by the axillary now. So all these four muscles forms the rotator cuff on the uh, shoulder. So what is the clinical significance of this rotator cuff? And these muscles help the shoulder uh, or the shoulder humerus to be in place with in place with the glenoid cavity. 
so it helps in the in our cavity okay um so as i said you this is the stomach and uh, origin everyone knows that this prospinal is from supraspinal fossa intraspinal is from intraspinous fossa and it gets attached to the greater tubercles so three muscles in the greater tubercle sit muscles in the greater tubercle another s muscle in the lesser tubercle the s muscle in the lesser tubercle is subscapularis which gets originated from the costal surface of the or the anterior surface of the scapula and it is only muscle which originates and gets attached to the lesser tubercle so it forms as a cup uh, protecting the humerus protecting the shoulder joint uh, and not the shoulder shoulder joint doesn't slip down or inferior or posterior or whatever so the supraspinatus sorry subscapularis helps to avoid anterior dislocation and all these muscles keeps the humerus um uh, high up so the easiest way or the weakest point of the humerus dislocation is inferior you can see there is no muscle which supports the humerus uh, which supports the shoulder joint inferiorly so it's very easy for the humerus to get dislocated inferiorly when there is a damage to this glenoid capsule so the inferior glenoid capsule has got uh, as good chances of increased chance of damage that increased chance to get damaged and it can cause it can cause inferior dislocation easily because the there are mes muscles which supports the humerus on the top on the and in the anterior and in the posterior top by supraspinatus and intraspinatus posterior by teres minor and the anterior by lesser tubercle sorry anterior by the subscapularis and there's no muscle on the bottom so that's why there is a chance of increased chance of um humerus dislocation inferiorly so these muscles uh, these uh, these uh, rotator cuff muscles are uh, are uh, fibrosed or can da get damaged in uh, adhesive capsulitis uh, okay coming on to this phases are the spaces is we remember um phases around the uh, uh human and these are the key spaces around the scapula one is the upper scap upper triangular space lower triangle and the third triangular space so don't think too much don't try to memorize most of the things here it's very very difficult to it is very difficult to memorize uh, this uh, um the borders of these spaces but it has got it has got good clinical significance so try to easy try to learn this picture keep use your two hands and two fingers the index finger and the middle finger of both your hands and just make a criss cross pattern uh, with your um, index finger and the middle finger of the two uh, two hands and represent the teres minor as i said you teres minor and major are the muscles from top to bottom in the scapula on the lateral aspect always when it comes to scapula minor at the top major at the bottom and so the middle finger represents on your left hand side the middle finger represents teres minor and the teres major here on the lower uh, index finger the long head of triceps is represented by the index finger on the other hand and the humerus on the middle finger represents the humerus on the other hand so now so we know this is this your left hand is going to act as a scapula and this one is going to act as a humerus so this is lateral and this is medial so the upper triangular space is here the upper triangular space the lateral border is formed by the triceps long head of triceps the superior border by the teres minor and the inferior by the border by the teres major so likewise on the other hand uh, the quadrangular space is so we have four four sides in a quadrangular space the superior border is by the teres minor the inferior border is by the teres major and the medial aspect is by the by the long head of pose uh, long head of tricep the lateral aspect by the humerus and the lower triangular space is formed by the again humerus on the lateral long head of triceps on the medial and the superior by the teres major so just try to remember this thing this picture and this uh, whenever it's it, it it gives very good clear 
a clear picture on the spaces and the borders of the spaces. And as we go to the contents, the quadrangular space contains the axillary nerve with the posterior circumflex humerus artery. The artery, this is the third, this posterior circumflex humeral artery is the branch of the branch of the uh, it's a branch from the third part of the it's a branch from third part of the axillary uh, sorry hum, uh, uh, axillary artery and this is where there is a injury to the surgical neck of the humerus and this causes the axillary nerve damage and the uh, upper scapular now the uh, the uh, blood vessel with the content of the upper scapular now is the um, circumflex scapular artery so this a part of this is a part of the arterial arcade around the scapula and this is the, the content of the lower uh, triangular space is the profunda brachii artery or the, and the radial now so this forms the content of the radial uh, gradial groove on the humerus so uh, the nerve which is there in the radial uh, radial groove or the spiral groove of the humerus is the radial nerve. Everyone knows that it's a radial nerve. So I'm here to just explain you easily or try to try to uh, help you to remember things in exams that easily. The spiral groove has got radial nerve in the um, uh, radial nerve in the spiral groove. So this is a part of the spiral groove. This lower triangular space is a part of the spiral groove and the um, um, radial nerve and the profunda brachial vessel, which is a branch of the brachial artery, is the are the contents of this lower triangular space. So try to remember this picture and try to keep your fingers like this, and uh, try to uh, remember the borders very easily. So you can make out the borders of the spaces easily in the uh, upper limb, and uh, the contents is the contents. How to remember the contents? Uh, the upper triangular space is near to the scapula, which has the uh, which has the circumflex scapular artery, which forms the uh, arterial um, uh, arcade around the scapula. The quadrangular is near the surgical neck of the. Everyone knows that the surgical there is a fracture of the surgical neck of humerus. We have the axillary nerve in the content of the and the triangular space it um, which is enclosed in the viral groove on the humerus which has got the radial which has got the radial now the now radial now is accompanied by the break -a. Okay, so this is another now the suprascapular now the significance here this picture is to emphasis on the suprascapular now which runs underneath the supras which is Sorry for the interference and uh, sorry for the interference. I think uh, there were some uh, technical problems. There was an internet uh, issue. Okay, so this slide is to show you that the suprascapular nerve runs in the notch and the suprascapular artery runs above. Uh, the command and the runs in the knot and this is the, nothing there's no nothing but the, both the muscles of the suprascapular uh, 
kapla super kapla ayan okay so next the most important thing which we have to remember in the exam about the clavicle is for the part b the people so appear the part b the side concave Sorry guys, I think there's some inter some some issues with the uh, internet. I'm not the connection. I think okay. So when it comes to the uh, uh, when it comes to the identification of a bone, which side a bone belongs to, right or left side of the bone. So there are two things. There are three aspects of the uh, uh, bone which we have to know. So first thing is the most important thing is the anterior or the posterior. Which which part of the bone is anterior? Which part of the bone is posterior? And which part of the bone is medial? Which part of the bone is uh, lateral? And which is the uh, which is the uh, which is the um, uh, upper end and the lower end? So if when we know these these three, any one of these three, it's easily it's very easy to identify. So in clavicle, the anterior aspect of the clavicle is always convex and the lateral medially and the lateral aspect is concave laterally. So, and this is a, a sided The aspect is, is thick and it gets attached to the sternum. The main process is all and if I is period and the inferior, there will be a subclavius period aspect for the attachment of the muscle cord. So these are the three which the uh, body clavicle or any which we have to know. Uh, sorry, the right to identify right or left, we have to add, we have to know which is medial and which is lateral, which is Superior and inferior lateral. So that's it. Medial, lateral, superior, inferior, anterior, and posterior. So we can identify just three points to identify the side of the uh, which side of the uh, uh, body belongs to. So clavicle again, I said you have all these three, it, it forms an arc in in relation with the acromion process and the spinous uh, and the spinous process and uh, the other muscle which is uh, which, get, which gets originated from the clavicle on the medial aspect is the uh, cledo cledo means clavicle so the sternal cledo mastoid uh, has uh, has its uh, uh, has its attachment on the medial side of the clavicle and the other muscle which is or which gets originated is the pectoralis major muscle on the medial aspect, so which forms the another muscle which covers the whole interior part of the chest. Okay, coming on to the next slide, and uh, the clinical significance of the clavicle is this is called a cleidocranial dysostosis, or uh, the uh, the absence of the clavicle. So uh, when there is a absence of clavicle, the condition is called as cleidocranial dysostosis, and the shoulders can be approximated when there is a absence of the shoulders can be both the shoulders can be brought together and there is an absence of clavicle so for coming on to the pectoral muscles there are two pectoral muscles pectoral is major and the pectoral is minor and the pectoral is major as i said do it originates from the medial end of the clavicle and the from the sternum and from the top six ribs 
and it gets attached to the um, uh, lateral lip of the bicipital groove in the humerus. So as I said you, it's going to act on the humerus because it's inserted into the lateral lip of the humerus. So when it acts on the humerus, it's going to push, it's going to pull the humerus chest so it gets adapted and the inferior fibers and the fibers can uh, make the humerus to flex, adduct, and it can cause the medial rotation as well. So the actions of the pectoralis major is adduction, medial rotation, and the flexion of the humerus or the arm. And when it go, when it comes to the pectoralis minor, so the minor gets originated from three, four, and fifth rib, and it gets attached to the coracoid process. So coracoid process got three or four muscles attachment. One is insertion of the pectoralis minor, and the other two is the long head of long head of biceps. That is other two are long head of biceps and the origin of the coracobrachialis. So it's going to push uh, scapula forward by getting inserted. So there is a forward movement of the scapula when, uh, when it comes to the action of the pectoralis minor. So the pectoral is under the uh, the uh, the posterior or in the posterior aspect of the pectoral is major. So when we reflect the pectoral is major, we see the pectoral is minor. We don't see the pectoral is minor as such directly. Is minor is 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 hidden by the pectoral is major. And the these two muscles, both the muscles are supplied by the pectoral now, lateral pectoral now, and the medial pectoral now. And they said you act so when we see the when when we when we insertion of two major in the uh, upper end of the humerus in the bicipital groove we have to come we have to know about these this mnemonic there is a lady between two major this is the bicipital groove is between the greater tubercle and the of the humerus the lesser tube always faces anteriorly and the greater tubercle laterally and uh, we know the top end will have the head of the humerus so this are the three points which we have to know uh, to uh, identify the side of the bone and this the, this dotted line is the surgical uh, anatomical neck of the humerus this dotted line between the head of the humerus and the anatomical neck and the surgical neck and this is the bicipital groove between the two tubercles, greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. As I said, the lesser tubercle always faces anteriorly and the greater tubercle posteriorly. We know the muscles which gets attached to the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. And the bicipital groove allows the tendon of the long head of the biceps to run in the bicipital groove. As I said, the mnemonics are lady between two majors. The two majors are the pectoral is major on the lateral lip and the tear is major on the medial lip from the posterior aspect. So one muscle anteriorly, one muscle posteriorly. The anterior muscle is the pectoral is major. The posterior muscle is the uh, tear is major. And the lady is going to be the lattice muscle dancer, which is inserted into the into the groove itself. So these uh, this is a mnemonic to remember. The lady between two majors uh, the, is, the, is the mnemonic and next okay so coming on to the shoulder joint movements shoulder joint has got a wide range of movements it has got all movements including flexion extension abduction adduction medial rotation lateral rotation and there's something called as circumduction so it has got uh, uh, almost like 180 degree movements here and there. you can move everything and uh, as I said, you there's a high risk of inferior dislocation because the muscle shoulder joint is not that supported by any muscle inferiorly. It's just by the glenoid capsule, which is supported by the which, which supports the shoulder joint inferiorly. And uh, the most important thing which I want to hear the ones of the shoulder uh, exam perspective is the muscles which causes abduction. As I said, you the abduction has got different degrees of abduction is acted by the different muscles 
and uh, the initial abduction is by the supraspinatus muscle the 15 to 70 degree the deltoid acts and the uh, abduction is uh, abdu the overhead abduction is the set as anterior from, 80, from 90 to 180 degree and also it, it is helped by the trapezium uh, trapezo trapezium uh, the lower fibers of the lower, lower fibers of the trapezium so the serratus anterior is a climbing muscle so when it when you have to take the muscle, uh, take the shoulder above 190 degree so it helps to climb the it, it helps to climb so it's called as climbing muscle or the serratus anterior and coming on to the flexion of the shoulder as i said you the flexion should be from the anterior aspect of the shoulder. So the muscle which is more important for flexion is pectoralis major and the deltoid muscle and deltoid anterior fibers. And when it comes to extension, the muscle which is on the posterior aspect is going to help. So the muscle which is posterior, as I said, you latissimus dorsi, which has got inverted insertion. The, the, there's a twist in the insertion of the muscle. So it helps in the extension of the, uh, especially when it is 45 to 60 degree of extension, it is latissimus dorsi. So adduction and muscle which is going to push, pull the arm towards the chest of the pectoralis major and latissimus dorsi from behind, pectoralis major from anterior and uh, uh, these are the two biceps and long head of triceps, this is not that important. And the medial rotation, again as I said you, the medial rotation is by pectoralis major anteriorly and the lat uh, latissimus dorsi posteriorly. So you can compare the medial rotation and the adduction. Most of the most of the muscles are same, and the lateral rotation of the um, uh, arm is by the deltoid posterior fibers. It's more important. This this is the only muscle which helps the um, posterior, which helps in the lateral rotation of the arm, and the other two muscles are infraspinatus and teres minor, which is not that important. So everyone knows. So other accessory muscles can be learned if but doesn't have that importance in the exams. So this is a biggest topic in upper limb, the breakage. Any, uh, any, any muscles in the upper in the upper upper limb is from the brachial plexus. Uh, the brachial plexus, as everyone knows, it has got roots, trunks, divisions, cards, and branches. And how? To, what is the clinical significance of this? Uh, when it comes to the exam, MRCS exam, it's going to be the clinical aspect, and the 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 applied anatomy is more important rather than the surgical, uh, rather than the uh, rather than an anatomy as such. So the roots and uh, the roots uh, from C C5 to T1, and uh, it gets the C5 and C6 combines to form the upper trunk, the C7 continues as a middle trunk, the C8 and T1 form, combines to form the lower trunk. So all these trunks divide into anterior and posterior division. So upper trunk, anterior and posterior, all the lower, all the posterior divisions of the trunks forms the posterior cord. So uh, this is very important. All the posterior divisions of the trunks forms the posterior cord. The anterior divisions of the upper and middle trunk forms the lateral card and the posterior division of the lower trunk forms the medial card all right and the cards lateral posterior and medial card gives rise to branches i'll get to the branches separately in a separate slide so these the roots trunks divisions and cards so what is the clinical significance of this is one thing is all the upper limb muscles are supplied by the brachial plexus nerves. And the other thing is the block. So there is something called as brachial plexus block. That's the clinical significance of the brachial, brachial plexus. Any arm surgery can be done under the brachial plexus block even for three to six hours without any issues when there is a long-term action of the nerve block. So what is the anatomical significance of this brachial plexus? Okay, the roots and the, uh, the roots and the trunks are near the scalene muscles. The roots and the trunks are near the scalene muscles. So it emerges out of the two scalene muscles, anterior scalenous, anterior scalenous uh, middle, scalene muscle 
and there is something called a supraclavicular and the infraclavicular region of the brachial plexus where the divisions happens so where the division happens so when the division happens when there is a block which is given in the supraclavicular region or the infraclavicular region uh, the landmark for the block is the um, subclavian artery so the subclavian artery is surrounded by the brachial plexus especially the divisions and the um, cords so the posterior cord is formed just inferior to the middle third of the clavicle so this is very important for the clinical purpose and when there is an infraclavicular block we are going to block the posterior um, card and also the, the lateral and the medial card is very close to the coracoid process where the pectoralis minor gets attached. So you can see the lateral card here and the posterior card here and this is the uh, medial card. So when we give an, a block here in this region with the help of ultrasound guidance, we just pick it up, we pick up the um, subclavian artery. When we give a block, the whole of the brachial plexus gets blocked and we can avoid, uh, we, we can block whole of the uh, nerve supply to the whole of the upper limb. And the most important thing which I want to stress here is the break uh, is the axillary artery, the subclavian artery, and the, it continues as axial artery. And uh, as it crosses the uh, pectoralis minor, it becomes the, uh, sorry, it, uh, as it crosses the teres, uh, teres minor, it crosses the, uh, it, it becomes the brachial artery. So this is the clinical sequence of the brachial and uh, trunks, divisions, cards, and inter and these are the blocks, intercalary block, supraclavicular block, intercalary block, and axillary block. And the landmarks are the subclavian, um, the subclavian artery, and the this minor is another landmark under which, uh, when it when we go behind our uh, inferior to theories minor. We can uh, branch of the uh, okay so again uh, I'm just a purpose and these are the um, nerve roots are the nerves from the medics the nerves uh, uh, which arise from the roots uh, C5, C6, C5 from the C5, C6, C7 uh, the nerve uh, which uh, which is very important now which, which comes from the roots of the long thoracic nerve of bell and uh, the these are the nerves from the roots there are third nerve which this other nerve which is the scapular nerve which supplies the rhomboids and the levator scapula and uh, the nerves from the trunk upper trunk the superior trunk which is very that's herbs point so very important in the uh, brachial plexus of clinical significance is herbs point there are six nerves which gets inserted at this point. So two roots, two branches from the trunks and two divisions or anterior division and posterior division. So this is the six nerve point where the herbs point is there. And this herbs point, there's a chance of injury to the herbs point when, the, when, the, when there is a difficult delivery uh, during the parturition. There's a chance of herbs palsy. And we'll come to the herbs palsy in the next few slides. And there are few, other, apart from uh, these herbs point, there's no other branches from the middle trunk and the inferior trunk, and there's no branches from the uh, uh, divisions. And when it comes to cards, the posterior and the medial card has got five division, five branches. The lateral card has got three branches. The lateral pectoral now, the muscular proteins, lateral root of the median now is from the lateral card. And when it comes to medial card, it forms the medial pectoral nerve so lateral cord gives rise to lateral pectoral nerve medial cord gives rise to middle pectoral nerve so two cutaneous nerves medial cutaneous nerve of forearm and mid arm and it gives one branch to the medial root of the median nerve and the ulna nerve in the medial cord so posterior cord again has got five branches 
ಅಪ್ಪರ್ ಸ್ಕ್ಯಾಂಪ್ಲ ನಾವು ಲೋವರ್ ಸ್ಕ್ಯಾಂಪ್ಲ ನಾವು ಆಕ್ಸಿಲ ನಾವು ರೇಡಿಯಲ್ ನಾವು ಆನ್ ದಿ ತೊರಕೋ ಡಾಸ್ ಅಲ್ ನಾವು ಡಾಸ್ ದಿ ತೊರಕೋ ಡಾಸ್ ದಿ ತೊರಕೋ ನಾವು ಆರ್ ಆರ್ ದಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟ್ ನಾವು ಡ್ಯೂರಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ರೀಕನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಷನ್ ಹಾವಿಂಗ್ his arms rotated internally and uh, his arm is uh, everything is it means flexions arm is uh, adductors are act so abductors are not acting so there's an active flexion which is impo- active flexion is impossible because of paralysis of bice- biceps brachialis and bri- brachioradialis and there is a paralysis of spinae which causes a, a pronation deformity of the forearm so that means he has, so it is internally rotated so what i want to say here is the most important thing which i want to say here is in exam there can be two types of questions here one is the what are the muscles affected uh, what are the things how is the position and the other thing is which which actions are impossible so try to keep your hands in such a way that the policeman tips or the porter tips and these are the muscles which are acting and the muscle which are not acting is the opposite muscles okay so coming on to the thumb muscles are the another big injury is it is in one of the lower trunk so there is a involvement of the c8 and t1 so when there is an involvement of c8 and t1 it's the medial aspect of the arm which is involved so any medial aspect t8 and t1 which is involved will, is is going to cause the claw hand so the clumkey's paralysis causes claw hand sometimes there is a chance of horner syndrome with some ptosis and because of the um, sympathetic plexus which is involved in the t1 or stellate ganglion which is involved with the t1 and it has got very poor prognosis so otherwise upper trunk involvement causes herb's palsy and the lower trunk in uh, lower trunk involves the clumkey's palsy and the classical uh, feature is claw hand as it involves the c8 and t1 you can see the c8 and t1 involves the medial aspect of the arm so another thing which is important to for the exam purpose is the uh, clavic pectoral fascia uh, the three structures which pierces the clavic pectoral fascia this is the clavicle this is pectoral muscle these are the pectoral fascia you can see the clavicle and the pectoral and this is the clavic pectoral fascia which engulfs the which engulfs the pectoral is minor and it gets attached to the as a suspensor ligament gets attached to the uh deep fascia of the armpit so this clavicular fascia is pierced by three structures one is the lateral pectoral nerve the other one is the thoracoacromial artery and the third one is the cephalic vein which runs uh, as a uh, which runs medially on the medial aspect of the uh, deltoid muscle and it runs into the uh, get, drains into the axillary uh, vein so this is just a uh, clinical significance uh, and uh, exam purpose so coming on to the artery supply of limb so i'm just going to give you overall view so that uh, we don't deal different arteries at different places so everyone knows that the right brachiocephalic gives rise to right subclavian and the right common carotid so this happens just behind the first first uh, behind the cost to um, uh, sternocostal angle between behind the sternal uh, sternum manibum sternum so uh, as soon as it gets originated the subclavian runs over the first rib so how it goes is like 
until it crosses the first strip. So you can see this picture until it crosses the first strip, it's still subcavian. When it crosses the first strip and it uh, when it uh, up to the lower end of the teres major, it's axillary artery. So two muscles are important. One is splenius anterior, which divides the subcavian artery into three parts. First, second part behind this um, uh, proximal to the sub uh, anterior uh, splenius anterior is the first one. Behind this splenius anterior is the second part, and uh, distal to the splenius anterior is the third part. And the first part of the axillary artery is uh, the uh, axillary artery is divided into three parts by the pectoralis minor muscle, and uh, this is uh, uh, first part proximal to the pectoralis minor behind the pectoralis minor and the distal to the pectoralis minor. So there are a few things which we can correlate and the clavian artery the axillary artery is divided into three points by the pectoralis minor. And so three parts, as it comes to three parts, we are going to discuss about the branches in three parts. So in when compared to subclavian artery, the axillary artery has got, uh, it goes in this way now. Uh, in the subclavian artery, the first part has got three divisions. The second part has got three branches, sorry, not three divisions, so three branches, the first part. And the second part has got two branches and the third part has got zero branches. But it, when it comes to the axillary artery, the first part has got one branch. The second part has got two branches. The third part has got three branches. So this is how we can remember the subclavian artery and the axillary artery. So subclavian artery, as I said you, first part of the subclavian artery has got three branches. And the second part of the subclavian artery has got two branches. And third part has got no branches. When it comes to axillary artery, the first part has got one, second part has got two, and the third part has got three branches. And let's come on to this branch of the subclavian artery. The most important branch of the subclavian artery is the vertebral artery. And the first part, as I said, the first part of the subclavian artery has got three branches. The three first branches are the vertebral artery, internal thoracic artery, and the thyrocervical tongue. So the vertebral artery, let's go to the next slide and then, sorry, uh, did I make it? Sorry, I think I missed that slide. Okay, so as I said, you the first part has got vertebral artery, so it runs higher up on the two sides, and it enters into the foramen of foramen in the spinous uh, and the transverse process of the cervical spines, and it enters into the spine and comes out, and it enters the base of the skull through the foramen magnum, and forms the basilar artery. Its most important artery, which supplies the uh, which which enters into the uh, it, which, which supplies the brain as well parts of third part of third of third part of the brain, and the internal thoracic artery is the artery which supplies the medial aspect, which enters into the thoracic cavity, and it gets gives branches to the uh, uh, breast. It also supplies the breast and the medial aspect, and the thyrocervical trunk. And this thyrocervical, the name itself says it has got branches to the thyroid, so the inferior thyroid is from the thyrocervical trunk which is a branch of the first part of the subclavian artery so there are three branches from the first part of the subclavian artery one is vertebral one is internal thoracic and the other third one is the thyrocervical artery the thyrocervical artery gives one branch to the thyroid which is inferior thyroid the superior thyroid is from the external carotid artery and the transcervical artery suprascapular artery are the other two branches from the thyrocervical trunk. So there are two branches uh, from the second part of the subclavian artery. One is the costocervical trunk. So that means it's going to supply the chest costo and the cervix and the other, sorry, cervical region. And the, the other branch is the dorsal scapular artery, which runs into the scapular region. So these are the two branches from the uh, second part of the subclavian artery. So coming on to the branches of the axillary artery, the first is divided by three parts by the pectoralis minor. The first part of the axillary artery gives branches to 
French called a superior thoracic artery. The second part gives rise to thoracoacromian branch. So thoracoacromian branch, it means it uh, uh, gives acromion uh, uh, and the clavicular. And the second branch is the lateral thoracic artery, which runs along the lateral thoracic uh, nerve of bell. And the third part has got three branches. One is the anterior circumflex, which runs around the humerus, the posterior circumflex, which again a part of the um, quadrangular space. And the third one is the uh, subscapular, uh, uh, third one is the subscapular artery. So this is how, just remember the things in such a way that two muscles, subclavian artery and the axillary artery, anterior and the pectoral is minor, uh, divides into three parts. First part in the subclavian gives three branches. Second part, two branches, no branches in the third part. First part of the axillary one, second part of the axillary branches, two branches and third part uh, has got three branches. So I think we dealt with these branches, superior thoracic, thoracoacromian, and the lateral thoracic artery, which forms the, uh, which helps, which runs around the lateral thoracic nerve of bell. So, okay, this picture, just I wanted to, dis which I want to discuss is the, so just compare this arteries with the dissection or the axillary dissection. So this is what we see in the axillary dissection that you can see two groups of bundles of nerves and arteries which are seen here. One is the lateral thoracic vein and artery and the nerve. Here I said you about the thoracodorsal bundle which includes vein, artery and nerve. So as I said, the thoracodorsal artery forms the pedicle for the LD flap. And when we injure this bunch of nerves, we uh, will land up long thoracic nerve with lateral thoracic artery and vein. We'll land up with the uh, uh, vein. So the two important nerve bundles which are more prone for injury during the axillary dissection is, one is the lateral thoracic bundle, one is the lateral thoracic bundle, and the other one is the thoracodorsal bundle. So this is a picture which shows about the thoracic artery which runs in the thorax and it is it will be on the lateral border on the inner aspect of the lateral border of the sternum and it gives it supplies to the anti intercostal um, intercostal arteries and it ends up in the phrenic branches and the superior epigastric arteries a branch of the internal thoracic artery uh, which is a branch of the first part of the subclavian artery. Finish of, uh, easy. rest of the uh, anatomy of the upper limb is very easy to remember we have to think about just few things and we'll go ahead easily so everyone knows about the um, uh, upper end how to identify the side so medial aspect is going to be the head of the humerus and it's going to be again upper end and the lateral aspect is going to be the uh, uh, lower end and the lateral aspect is going to be the lateral condyles and uh, uh, anterior surface is going to be lesser tubercle. The posterior lateral aspect is going to be the tub, uh, to be the greater tubercle or the greater tuberosity. So nothing much from here and uh, arm muscles. Okay, coming on to the arm muscles, the most just three again as I said you earlier, when how to remember the nerve supply of the muscles. Try to remember it in groups. So the anterior aspect of the arm has got three muscles: the bicep brachii the uh, brachialis and the coracobrachialis. These are three muscles which are in the upper upper arm and anterior, anterior compartment of the arm. And these three, all these three muscles are, all three muscles are cutaneous nerves. And the musculocutaneous nerve, when it comes to musculocutaneous nerve, we have to uh, know that it pierces the uh, uh, it pierces the coracobrachialis. Okay, so all these muscles are in the anterior compartment of the arm. Three muscles in the anterior compartment of the arm. 
and everyone knows now the biceps the biceps origin is from the uh, superior uh, aspect of the glenoid tubercle the tendon runs into the uh, bicipital groove and forms the muscle bulk and gets inserted into the radial tuberosity and on the medial aspect of the radius okay curved brachial is as i said already the origin from the coronoid insertion is going in the tumors of the medial aspect and the brachial is form its origin is in the lower end of the humerus and it gets attached to the ulna uh, coronoid of ulna so what happens is this is the muscle which is the strong flexor of the elbow and press two two joints one is one is the shoulder joint and the elbow joint the much of the action is found in the elbow joint as it crosses the elbow joint it gets attached to the uh, radius of the uh, radial to cross of the radius uh, sorry by uh, yeah and uh, as i said you the group of muscles which supplies this muscular cutaneous now which ends as a uh, it which continues as a lateral antibrachial cutaneous now it's a cutaneous now so the now itself says it's got two part two parts musculo cutaneous now so one is muscle the group of muscle which is supplied the biceps coracoid process and the brachialis and it continues as a lateral uh, cutaneous now on the elbow so i think that with this, okay when it comes to the posterior aspect of the arm, as I said, the three muscles which are in the arm, the anterior aspect is the brachialis, biceps, and the uh, corcobrachialis. The only muscle which is on the posterior aspect of the arm is the triceps brachii or the triceps muscle. So when it says triceps, it has got three origin. One origin is the infraglenoid tubercle, which we dealt already during the uh, when we said about the scapula. And the other two origin is from the humerus posterior shaft and the lateral shaft all these origin gets inserted into olecranon process on the posterior aspect so it's attached are uh, inserted to the olecranon process on the posterior aspect the muscle is represented in the posterior side of the arm and gets attached to the posterior aspect of the elbow or the olecranon process so it's actually the XO arm what i wanted to stress when it comes to the upper limb most almost all of the muscles on the posterior aspect of the arm and the forearm is supplied by radial now so you can straight away think about radial now when it comes to the muscle supply now supply of the posterior aspect of the arm muscles uh, the posterior aspect of the uh, forearm muscles are uh, any extensor in other words any extensor muscles we have to think about the radial now so the radial now supplies most of the uh, uh, muscles of the arm uh, and the forearm and if we don't if we are not able to find out the radial now in the forearm we have to think about the posterior interosseous now which again is a branch of the radial now so think about the radial now for triceps or uh, the posterior interosseous now and the radial now for forearm extensions okay this is another important uh, landmark question which can be asked uh, frequently in any exams the relationship of the mid now to the brachial artery so uh, the upper or uh, the cephalic and uh, upper end of the uh, median now the median now is always lateral to the brachial artery and it runs anterior to the brachial artery when it comes to the cubital, cubital fossa it becomes the medial most relationship to the brachial artery so this is another important relationship between the medial median now to the brachial artery so this picture we can see the median now, the arrow mark shows the median now, which is lateral to the brachial artery and the upper end. It crosses the uh, it crosses the brachial artery anteriorly. When it comes to the lower end of the arm, it becomes the medial relationship to the uh, brachial artery and it stays medially and it becomes the medial most structure in the cubital fossa. So this is another diagram which forms the 
collaterals around the elbow joint and uh, that won't be much of the question from here and uh, and of fractures of the humerus surgical head of the humerus fracture or injury to the axilla now which causes the now decreased uh, uh, which causes the loss of sensation on the shoulders and of the same side so the radial now injury can happen in the middle of the fracture and the middle of the humerus can cause injury to the radial now and also to the profundo brachii artery and it can cause the radial now injury can cause wrist drop usually the injury to the radial now in the uh, in the spiral groove spas the extension of the elbow because the now supply to the triceps are higher up from the higher up from the spiral groove so another thing is the medial cubital vein which is the uh, vein which runs between the cephalic vein and the basilic vein which is used as the vein for any intravenous infusions or any intravenous drug administration okay so coming on to the cubital so the cubital is an important landmark which is present which is present in the anterior aspect of the elbow so three so it's a triangular space so if it is a triangle it has got three sides middle and lateral is formed by muscle superior is formed by an imaginary line which connects the two epicondyles so always when the elbow is extended, these three points, the medial epicondyle, the olecranon process, and the lateral epicondyle should be in a straight line. If this straight line is altered, either there's a dislocation or a fracture of the olecranon process or the epicondyles or the distal of the humerus. And when the elbow is flexed, it forms a triangle in the posterior aspect. So this triangle is, this landmark is important to diagnose a patient who has got supracondylar fracture. So this triangle is very important. Medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle, and the auricular process form the triangle when the elbow is flexed. And when the elbow is extended, this forms a line, a straight line. So when these landmarks are altered, think about a dislocation of the elbow or the supracondylar fracture. So likewise, the cubital fossa, the middle and lateral epicondyle, it's an imaginary line. The cubital fossa is a triangle face formed on the anterior aspect of the elbow. And the superior part, is, the superior aspect is an imaginary line. The lateral border is formed by the uh, medial, uh, lateral border is formed by the brachioradialis and the medial border is formed by the pronate arteries. So when it when it comes to pronatus, think about the median now, which pierces, uh, which runs between two heads of pronatus, and there are a few things which have to remember is the median now, which pierces the pronatus, musculoskeletal cutaneous now, which pierces the coracobrachialis, and uh, so this is the this is the border of the cubital fossa. The structures from medial to lateral, which is present in the cubital fossa are, as I said, you relationship of brachial artery to break uh, median now. At the lower end of the arm, the median now is medial to the brachial artery. The median now is medial to the brachial artery. So the medial most structure is median now. Next comes the brachial artery. And next comes the biceps tendon, which is taken off here. And the lateral most structure is radial now. So think about anything lateral as a radial now and medial cubital fossa here there's an alternative. Usually when we think about medial structures, always we think about the ulna now. So the ulna now is not the medial most, it's not, it's not the uh, content of the cubital fossa in the medial aspect, it's the median now. And this median now gives rise to anterior intraceous now. So AIN is from median now the PIN uh, post interest now is from the radial now. So any muscle which are the flexors of the flexor muscles which originate from the flexor origin is supplied by the median now or the anterior now. And any extensor muscles on the forearm is supplied by the posterior interosseous now or the radial now. So these are the two nerves which supplies the 
uh, it supplies the forearm muscles. Median now is median now supplies the flexors of the forearm. The radial now supplies the ex of extensors of the forearm. So don't try to memorize most of the things. Just try to memorize FDP, FTS, flexa digitorum superficialis, flexa digitorum profundus, flexa copae radialis, flexa copae ulnaris. So these are the four important muscles which we have to other muscle which we have to know as the supineta muscle. It runs around the radius and gets um, inserted here in the ulna. So what I want to stress here is stay in trunch as now is the supineta muscle here. So that's what the picture is meant for. And these now, which is the median now, which runs between the two heads of the pronata teres. So is now piercing the muscle musculocutaneous now pierces coracobrachialis median now pierces the pronata teres ulna now pierces the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris and the cubital tunnel also called as cubital tunnel syndrome the posterior intrusion now pierces the supineta so these are the four muscles which in the in the upper upper arm upper limb where the now pierces the muscle so coming on to the bones so again to identify the side of the bone Radius upper in this circular and it has got facet uh, circle, uh, it has got facet to uh, accommodate the um, uh, the humerus and the tuberosity and the lower end has got stylet process on the radius and the lower end anterior it is flat and posterior it is rounded the stylet process of the ulna is the most prominent uh, part. So think about the olecranon process. The flat surface of the olecranon process is always posterior, and the trochlea is present. The trochlea notch is present for the trochlea uh, of the humerus, and this forms the anterior. So upper end, lower end, anterior, medial, and, and medially you have the radial notch. So three things which we have to know, as I said, you upper end, upper anterior, medial, or lower posterior lateral. So you can use any combination, whichever is possible, of this three, six. You need one in each so that we can identify which side the bone belongs to. So it can be either upper end and lower end, or it can be anterior, posterior, it can be medial, lateral. So when it comes to this, I used to think about upper end, which is circular. The lower end has got a stylet process laterally, stylet process laterally and uh, the upper end has got the circular facet to accommodate the humerus. And the anterior has got broad uh, anterior radius. So these three things is more important. And again, it's very easy to identify the ulna again. The, the medial aspect, uh, the lateral aspect of sorry, the lateral aspect of the um, ulna bone has got radial notch of the ulna to accommodate this radial ulna joint, which, which forms the radial ulna joint. So that's easy. And the common flexor origin from the medial aspect, the common extensor on the origin from the medial, sorry, medial epicondyle, the common extensor origin from the lateral epicondyle. Don't try to memorize everything, just memorize, just logically think about FDP, FDS, FDS and uh, flexor copy ulnaris, flexor copy radialis, pronator teres, and the supinator teres, supin supinator and pronator teres, which are the so we know about the pronator teres, which forms the lateral border, of, sorry, which forms the medial border of the uh, cubital fossa, and the uh, pronator quadratus muscle, which is which is that in the uh, lower end of the uh, forearm muscles. Okay, so no supply, as I said, you already all the forearm muscles, flexors of the forearm muscles are supplied by the medial, and the extensors of the forearm muscles are supplied by the radial nerve. Are the posterior interstitial now? Flexor muscles of the and uh, flexor muscles of the forearm is supplied by the median now or the anterior uh, anterior interstitial now. Okay, so this is anterior interstitial now, which supply the flexor digitorum profundus, flexor pulsus longus, and pronator quadratus, and uh, um, so this is the clinic classical anterior interstitial syndrome anterior interstitial nerve syndrome when there is a loss of anterior interstitial now you have this flexion deformity in the index and the extension deformity in the uh, extension deformity in the thumb because the flexor 
um, the flexor polis is long, this is gone, and the flexor digitorum uh, profundus is gone, so it goes for this kind of um, deformity. And as I said, so these are the extant samosules. Don't get, uh, uh, don't memorize all these things. Uh, it's not going to help you. Just think about one now, which which supplies all these muscles are uh, the radial now, and the now which is another now which supplies this is post interactions now. They are not going to ask you what are the action of um, uh, this specific now specific muscle if at all if they ask any muscles you have the answer in the muscle itself or in vice versa so <clears throat> any muscle flexa carpi ulnaris is going to be in the ulna side it's going it's going to cause flexion of the carpal bones or deflection of the wrist as it is in the ulna side it's going to cause the adduction of the wrist so it's very easy to remember any muscle action of the forearm so flexor, flexion, anaris, either it 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 it, it fixes or it causes adduction. Extensa, it extends, it causes extension and the also and also the adduction. So when it comes to corpus radialis, so it causes abduction as it is in the radial aspect, and it causes extensa. Extensa corpus radialis brevis. So any muscle which is brevis is going to help the longest muscle. So previous muscle helps the longest muscle and the extensa carpi radialis. So it causes extension of the carpal or the wrist bone and the radialis or it's as it is in the radial side, it can, it can also cause the abduction. If it is there in the ulna side, it's going to cause the uh, adduction. Okay, when it comes to policies, it's going to help the thumb to thumb. So when it comes to policies, it's abductor, abduction of the thumb, extensor policy, it extends the thumb, extensor policy is long as again, extensor thumb, extends the thumb. So with the name itself says the actions of the muscle. And when it comes to no supply, try to think about the common now or the radial now or whatever the now, which I said you like groups of muscles and the groups of nerves. That's it. So post interest is now, as I said, you groups of, um, uh, it supplies all the extensor muscles of the uh, extensor muscles on the posterior on the posterior aspect of the forearm. So pronation and supination are the important. The supination happens in the superior and inferior radial joint. The pronation and supination happens in the superior radial ulnar joint and the inferior radial ulnar joint. And the pronation is by the pronator quadratus and the pronator teres. The supination is by the supinator and also by the biceps, biceps brachii. So the supination in the mid uh, uh, flex, the, when the elbow is flexed 90 degree and when there is a supination and pronation, supination, it's by the biceps muscle. So coming on to the wrist drop, uh, I think instead of this slide, let me go to this slide. This is, this will be much more helpful. So the wrist uh, injury to the radial now, and as I do, uh, the now has got sensory and the motor aspect. So radial now injury can cause the wrist drop. Okay. So how to find out is it high radial now injury or low radial now injury any injury to the radial now on the spiral group it is not going to impact the extension of the elbow as i said you the radial the triceps is supplied by the uh, uh, radial now higher above the nerve branches the branches to the triceps uh, comes higher up above the spiral groove so most of the time the triceps uh, gets its blood, uh, gets its nerve supply, though there is an injury to the uh, radial nerve in the spiral too. So extension of the elbow is not left. However, when they, even there's an injury below the spiral, or uh, from there's injury in the spiral groove, there is a chance of wrist drop because the nerve doesn't act on the extensor muscles. So there's a 
defective extension of the wrist which causes wrist drop okay so in the axilla it uh, the radial now supplies the long head of pile long head of triceps and the medial head of triceps that's why if there is an injury level of axilla then the extension can be compromised but if the injury is that the spiral groove the elbow extension cannot be but it will be still intact though there is an injury to the radial now in the spiral groove so the common mind's mentality is as injury to the radial as there is an injury to the radial now in the spiral groove at the level of the triceps the the uh, extension of the elbow can be lost but it's not like that so as the nerve it's the muscles as the muscles of the nerves higher up so the elbow elbow extension is still intact however there is a chance of wrist drop when there is a chance of injury to the elbow radial now in the spiral too okay so don't think about other things and just think about this thing so when there is an injury to the radial now you lost the sensation over the anatomical snuff box or uh, it is otherwise called a superficial branch of the radial now supplies the anatomical skin over the anatomical snuff box so when there is a loss of sensation over the anatomical snuff box there is a injury to the radial now including it can be superficial branch of the radial now so just remember this elbow extension is intact even though there is an injury to the spiral uh, radial now with the spiral group and there is a there is a loss of sensation of the uh, skin over the anatomical snuff box when there is a injury to the radial now and it can cause uh, um, injury to the it can it can be because of injury to the superficial branch of the radial now the medial now injury can cause uh, um, decrease now supply there's a loss of now supply to the forearm muscles as i said you when there is an injury to the medial now the forearm muscle flexors of the forearm is not going to act and the most important thing which we have to see about the median nerve injury is the thena eminence so this thena eminence there is a loss of uh, atrophy there is a loss of tone or uh, there is an atrophy of the thena eminence these are the muscles thena eminence thena thena muscles are the mu muscles supplied by the median now so you can see the loss of uh there's atrophy of the thena muscles and the deformity is called as aptum deformity so when there is a flexion of the uh medial three fingers it's not they are not they're not able to flex it and there is a um, flexion of the they, they are not able to flex the uh index and the thumb so these are the classical feature when there's a the most important thing which i want to stress is the thena muscles are supplied by the median nerves as atrophy of the median nerve when there is a uh, there is atrophy of the thena muscles and there is an injury to the median now so altogether some far hand alna now injury this drop real now injury septum deformity is by the median now is because of the median injury another question which can be asked is total claw hand so when the combined injury of the median now and the ulna now we get total claw hand so the complete claw hand is because the combined injury of the ulna now and the median now and uh, if it is partial on the mean aspect alone so it can be claw hand of the medial aspect of the uh, it is partial claw hand which is the isolated ulna now so when there is an ulna now injury you lose the hypothenar prominence when there is a injury to the median now you lose the thena prominence okay mas now supply of the muscles of the hand so to remember this any muscles in the hand we can we can get answer for no supply of any muscles in hand just by knowing this loaf muscles so you just remember this loaf muscles we can answer any muscles 
nerve supply for any muscles in the hands. So what are these lobe muscles? Lobe muscles are lateral two lumbricals, that's three and four, and the opponent's pollicis, abductor pollicis, and flexor pollicis. All these three muscles, OAF muscles, forms the thenar eminence. So that means this thenar eminence, as I said you already, it is going to be the median now. So the one now in this thenar eminence, which is supplied by the ulna now, so the adductor pollicis is supplied by the ulna now and all the loaf muscles, opponent's pollicis, opponent's pollicis, sorry, abductor pollicis brevis and flexor pollicis brevis. All these three muscles and these four muscles are supplied by the median now. So any muscle which is, sub, any muscles in the hand apart from these muscles are supplied by ulna now doesn't even think about anything when they ask about the muscle supply or nerve supply for hand muscles think about this slope muscles if you see that if these muscles are that then answer this median now if there is no if there is anything apart from these muscles it's all other muscles are supplied by the alnano for example, what is the nerve supply of dorsal intraarchus? Uh, the uh, 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 um, palmar intraarchus or dorsal intraarchus? Whatever palmar intraarchus. So we don't know the answer. So what could be the answer? So it doesn't comes under the lobe muscle. So the answer will be the deep uh, ulna now. So palmar intraarchus, dorsal intraarchus, medial lumbricals. Hypothena, so abductor for abductor digiti minimi. So, what is the now supply of abductor digiti minimi? Come under the of muscle, so it is the uh, it's alna now. So, what is the sub uh, what is the now supply of the adductor pollicis brevis? Adductor pollicis brevis, whether is that is it, it does it come under low muscle? No, so it is alna now. So, except these three these four muscles lobe muscles any muscles which are there in the hand is supplied by the ulna now so lateral two lateral two lumbricals opponent's pollicis abductor pollicis flexor pollicis previous all these four muscles are supplied by median now rest all are supplied by either you can say as a deep branch of the ulna now or ulna now so whichever is is the option we can choose that option so coming on to the actions of the flexor digitorum profundus and flexor digitorum superficialis. So the flexor digitorum profundus is a tendon which gets inserted into the base of the distal phalanx. So it helps in the, so as I said you, the muscle acts on the bone where it gets inserted. So it acts on this bone and it flexes the distal interphalangeal joint. Okay, flexor FDP it gets inserted into the base of the uh, terminal phalanx. It acts on the terminal phalanx, so it only flexes the distal interphalangeal joint. Okay, so flexor digitorum superficialis or FDS. The FDS splits into two and it gets inserted to the um, on the lateral aspect of the uh, phalanx. So when it acts, it's going to act only on this muscle, so it is going to flex the proximal interphalangeal joint. So FDP gets inserted into distal phalanx, so it causes distal interphalangeal joint flexion. The FDS inserts into the um, uh, base of the um, middle phalanx, so it gets, it acts on the proximal interphalangeal joint. So these are the actions of the FDP and the FDS in the fingers, and likewise the extensor uh, muscles acts on the extension of the uh, phalanx. So coming on to the nerve supply of the hand. So complicated. Remember the logic behind this. All the medial aspect is ulna, and the middle aspect is the median uh, now or the radial now. So it is na, either it can be anterior or the posterior. Uh, ventral or the dorsal aspect. 
medial one and a half on the anterior is by ulna now and the lateral two and a half so lateral three and a half is by the median now anteriorly when it comes to posterior or dorsal aspect you divide the hand into two aspect two nose as two and a half two and a half and as i said you earlier posterior is always dominated by the radial now so give a chance to the radial now to supply the dorsal aspect of the uh, hand and again medial aspect is always dominated by the ulna now so it gets dominated as two and a half two and a half on the dorsal aspect one and a half and three and a half on the ventral aspect but when it comes to the tips when it comes to the tips again the whole of the hand the three and a half of the dorsal aspect is supplied by the sensation sessions are supplied by the median now the radial now though it dominates on the posterior aspect it gives up on the uh, lateral uh, three and a half to the median now and again the median uh, the ulna now supplies the uh, medial aspect of the dorsal hand so altogether just three nerves are there in the hand ulna radial and medial so the ulna now supplies the medial aspect of the hand so it shares just one and a half on the anterior but two and a half on the posterior or the dorsal aspect the median now dominates on the ventral aspect but it gives up on the dorsal aspect but it takes up the three and a half three and a half chance on the dorsal aspect as well but the radial now dominates on the posterior aspect always or the extensor aspect always so it takes up the two and a half rest of the two and a half of the ulna now on the dorsal aspect so very simple just make sure that three nerves anterior and posterior one and a half three and a half anterior two and a half two and a half posterior when it comes to three fingers median now and the ulna now three and a half and the one and a half rule still works out for the median now on the dorsal aspect as well when it comes to the dermatome which dermatome so it's very easy to remember the dermatome start from the shoulder go around the thumb and come to the little finger and go on the medial aspect start from the shoulder the shoulder is always supplied by the c5 dermatome and touch this touch the thumb tip of the thumb it's by c6 touch the tip of the middle finger it's by c7 tip of the uh, little finger it's c8 and touch the medial aspect of the forearm it is t1 so don't try to remember most of the things it's just c5 6 7 8 and t1 c5 is shoulder or uh, the lateral aspect of the arm lateral aspect of the arm thumb middle finger little finger and the medial aspect of the forearm c5 c6 c7 c8 and t1 so any sensation loss of sensation at the lateral aspect of the arm c5 is last tip of the thumb c6 is last tip of the middle finger c7 is last tip of the eighth, little finger c8 is last and t1 on the middle aspect of the forearm or the middle aspect of the make it as middle as forearm so this is the dermatome of the upper limb and again coming on to the um, coming on to the my, my tome c5 again as you start from the shoulder shoulder abduction is by c5 elbow flexion is by c6 elbow extension is by c7 thumb extension is by c8 and finger adduction is by t1 as i said you already adduction and abduction are by the palmar interosseous and the dorsal palmar interosseous causes pad and dab that's the universal mnemonic pad palmar interosseous ad stands for adduction of the palmar interosseous adduction palmar interosseous causes adduction of the fingers and the dab dorsal interosseous which causes abduction of the fingers dab is for d for dorsal interosseous ab for abduction so d a b d for dorsal interosseous ab for abduction causes the so c5 shoulder abduction c6 seven flexion and extension of elbow c8 thumb extension and the myotome of t1 finger adduction fingers adduction so these are the radial now roots and uh, as i said you axillary now is regiment band regiment band is nothing but 
paste it on the shoulder. So C5 and C6, as I said, you are going T5 shoulder abduction, shoulder sensation, all starts from the lateral aspect of the shoulder. And uh, radial now, which has got all now roots C5, C6, C7, C8, T1. All now, as I said, you it dominates on the medial aspect of the arm. It's C8 and T1. The medial now, which dominates uh, all over like C5, C6, C7, C8, T1. Musculocutaneous now, it dominates the anterior muscle of the arm, C5, C6, and C1, C7. So think about the nerve roots and relate it to the um, specific location. So we are nearing the uh, uh, end of the lectures. It's, it's a flexor retinal plum. Uh, the most important thing, which is important for the exam purpose, is the structures deep to the flexor retinal plum and the superficial to the flexor retinal plum. Don't try to remember any everything. Just try to remember one thing. Structure deep to the flexor retinal plum is very important. The median now flexor pollicis longus, flexor coiper radialis, FD, FDS. NDS, FDP, FDS, FPL, and flexor copper ulnaris. So these are the structures which are present underneath the flexor retinoculum. And this, when there is a contraction of the flexor retinoculum, there is an increased um, uh, pressure in the, over the median now, which causes the parietal contracture. So, sorry, which causes the um, uh, injury, to, which causes the median now compression and causes from deformity so dupiter contraction is due to the uh pharma aponeurosis contraction of the pharma aponeurosis more, more or less similar to the uh, so another thing is important is the uh as the anatomical purpose for the mrcs must party is the uh, scaphoid artery artery is right for the scaphoid so the new arteries of the scaphoid can be like this one uh, directly on the proximal to one blood supply to the proximal end and the one to the distal segment. So when there's a fracture, they have got two blood supply, there won't be any problem with the necrosis of the distal seg proximal segment. If the, if the blood supply is from the distal to proximal, if there are two blood, both of the blood supply is from the distal to proximal, there's a chance of necrosis of the proximal segment, which gets revealed after one or two weeks. The questions will be like, tenderness over the snuff box uh, after two or three days or after two or three weeks of injury. So there is a chance of necrosis of the proximal segment of the scaphoid is the answer. So anatomical snuff box is another uh, of, uh, importance in MRSS part B is uh, just think of the, so think about this picture, don't uh, so thumb and the muscles are the tendons which supplies the thumb forms the borders of the anatomical snuff box. So abductor is going to be always lateral. So abductor pollicis longus forms the lateral border of the snuff box and the medial border is the extensor pollicis longus and be brevis. So these, sorry, lateral border is formed by the extensor pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus. The medial border is formed by the extensor pollicis longus and the content is the radial artery as I said, you the superficial branch of the radial nerve supplies the skin over the anatomical snuff box. So when there is a loss of sensation over the anatomical snuff box, so the superficial radial nerve injury has happened, or there is a radial nerve injury. Any tenderness over the anatomical snuff box, again the bone which is underneath the anatomical snuff box is the scaphoid and the trapezium. So the scaphoid the chances of injury to the scaphoid or the scaphoid fracture uh, uh, can be picked up by the tenderness of over the anatomic snuff box. Thank you all. And I think I almost uh, um, did my, most of the things we, we have covered most of the things. And I'm not sure how far this would have been helpful. It was not a clear, um, I don't think we we have touched everything almost all in the upper limb. So those who are appearing for the exam it can be a uh, a revision module. Uh, it can be for some people it can be helpful. So anyone who wants to discuss anything can any questions. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, being uh, so you can unmute yourself and go ahead for.
any discussion if you want any any clarification about MRCs or MRCs party exams or whatever uh, regarding anatomy or anything, you can come up with the questions that will help you out. So you can unmute yourselves, guys. Now you can unmute if you want. You can unmute. Anyone wants to discuss about anything? It can be anything regarding MRCS, uh, regarding anatomy of the upper limb, or uh, you can. Uh, I've got some another five minutes, or uh, two to five minutes for you guys to ask any questions. Hello. Hello, hi. Uh, you are yeah. uh, Mr. Romanas. Yes, um, yes I'm a registrar in South Africa. Got a clear perspective. Yeah, I just oh, want to say yeah. thank you for the yeah. wonderful presentation. It's been excellent. Thank, thank you, you so much. It's been useful for me. Thank you. So, any doubts or anything which you want to uh, discuss? No, I'm, I'm okay for now. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So this lecture can be available, will be available in YouTube uh, in my channel. Uh, for further, uh, if anyone needs anything, they can rewind back and they can have a look. I'll share this in the YouTube. Thank you guys for attending. I think it should have been a helpful session. If there is anything, I'll add up to this thing. Uh, later on thank you tomorrow there will be a session on colonoscopic emergencies for frcs people so uh, if anyone is interested they can attend this uh attend this session it will be and the it will be at 5 p.m uk time oh, sorry it's 5 p.m or 6 p.m uk time that's it thanks for you thanks thank you all for attending thank you thanks a lot thank you bye